Hello everyone! Very, very, very nice to see you again today. And today we are going to tackle a metaphysical topic. We are going to look at time travel. I plan to do maybe a follow-up video on this. Hopefully I'll have time for that. And today we are going to dive in into some of the core questions and one of the most interesting paradoxes around this issue. Um, what is time travel? That's where we have to start. Well, let's turn to David Lewis. He wrote one of the best articles on this, and this is going to be pretty much the basis of our video today. So Lewis says, what is time travel? Inevitably, it involves discrepancy between time and time. Any traveler departs and then arrives at his destination. The time elapsed from departure to arrival, positive or perhaps zero, is the duration of the journey. But if he is a time traveler, the separation in time between departure and arrival does not equal the duration of the journey. Right, so Lewis's focus is um, on the question whether time travel is logically possible. It's not really looking at whether it's physically or actually possible, or is time travel self-contradictory. And what he says here is, think about how you travel by car. You get into your car, and maybe you go 50 kilos away and it takes an hour if the road is a bit busy and you follow the speed limits, right? Um, but in that certain sense you time traveled, of course, it's one hour later when you arrive there. However, the time difference between now and the future to which you're traveling it takes you exactly one hour to get there and it's exactly one hour later. Um, when it comes to time travel, it seems, at least intuitively, that it should be possible that you travel from 2024 to 2124. The time difference would be 100 years. But maybe traveling there would only take you 10 minutes or 10 hours. So the duration of the travel and the difference between the two times would be different. Now, this is the kind of interesting time travel that we are after. So what we do here and what we don't, just a quick clarification. We do discuss philosophy, logic and metaphysics, but we do not really talk about physics or engineering or science. Why not? Well, one is I don't have the expertise to do so. The other is it takes a lot of time. Uh, I'm a philosopher, not an engineer, and even in philosophy my specialty is in philosophy of time. Of course, people who work on time as philosophers or in any other field will know a lot about what's going on in the other field. You know, some of my friends are very knowledgeable about the current up-to-date physics and so on. I'm not. This is just an introductionary video to one of the basic um, problems. And what we are going to work with is mainly this Lewis article, because this is an excellent starting point if you want to get into the topic of time travel. Alright, so how could we approach this? Well, Lewis's suggestion, and almost everyone uh, endorses this, we should distinguish between personal and external time. What does this mean? Well, we are worried about a self-contradiction, right? Self-contradiction would be that um, how can we exist at a time where we are not yet born? Let's say I traveled 200 years into the past. Um, I wasn't born yet at the time. So saying that it's a time when I don't exist and it's a time when I exist because I time traveled back and I'm there seems self-contradictory. The other thing is, uh, what if I travel 300 years into the future? Now this poses the same kind of problem. I'm not really supposed to exist anymore, but hey, I exist. Um, so, can I be identical with the person who is there? Well, the, or the person who I am. I'm not really supposed to be alive yet or anymore, but I am. Um, well, this is why it's good to distinguish between personal and external time. Uh, if you take personal time, that's time experienced by the time traveler. If you take external time, that's the time registered in the world by major events and changes, right? So. Um, this would help us, if you take this example, you travel back in time to 1793, you travel 230 years back in external time, well, 231 now. But maybe in terms of personal time, only a few hours have passed. So 
in this sense, we can exist at a time when we are not born, because in terms of our personal time, we are still within the boundaries of our lifetime. If I happen to live 85 years, and I travel back 231 years, and uh, that only takes me, say, a day or two, um, I'm still going to be alive, right? that's perfectly plausible. So the contradiction kind of goes away because my personal time sets the limits as to where I can exist in time without contradiction. So you see, this is very philosophical. You make a little distinction and it solves one uh, logical problem that you would face straight away. Now another thing that comes out from reflecting on time travel is that it's a little bit different to travel forward and backwards in time. Um, forward time travel does not seem to be very problematic, actually uh, almost everyone in the physics community agrees that Einstein's special theory of relativity also predicts that this is possible. Um, Nobody says, of course, that right now we are able to do it. Uh, the engineering, the actual um, science, and the actual implementation of that science uh, is, and logic is problematic and difficult, and something that humans still have a lot of work to uh, do to implement and solve. But um, at least logically, and in terms of the basic physics of our universe, it seems possible. The limit just seems to be how long the time travel takes in terms of personal time, right? Like you can't travel for a long, can't be on your way for a longer time than uh, the duration of your life. Um, okay, backwards time travel is a lot more controversial for several reasons. Well, some physicists speculate that if there would be a powerful enough black hole, that could enable it or there would be some other mega dense, immensely heavy um, object with uh, crazy gravitational pull, maybe that would enable some kind of link to previous states of the universe. Um, but here we're really just looking at the logical problems. Okay, so maybe that's possible, maybe not, I can't decide go and look up some videos, there are some really fun things and some articles and books on it if you want to delve into the science part. What we want to know is, is there some kind of logical theory that already shows that it doesn't even make sense to start thinking about the science because already um, just you know by thinking about it we can figure out that this idea doesn't make sense. And one group of such worries is called the grandfather paradoxes. Some people think that these paradoxes show that uh, the idea of backwards travel is impossible. Um, and the grandfather paradoxes emerge if you ask the following question. Can you travel back in time and kill one of your grandparents before the conception of your parents? Okay, so of course, if you kill them after the conception of your parents, well, your parents might as well be born and then you can be born. But if your parents have not yet been conceived, um, and you can kill one of your grandparents, how can you exist? One of the people who begot you died before they could help bring your family line into existence. If you cannot kill your grandparents, why not? Like, let's assume you travel back in time, it's a sunny, clear day, you're very near to your grandfather, you have a perfectly fine, well-working gun, all the circumstances line up well, you're a good shot, you've practiced this, why would you not be able to kill your grandpa in that case? Um, what stops you from killing someone in the past? It's difficult, right? So we get basically a dilemma with two horns. Um, and both horns, the you can and you cannot, they don't look attractive. Neither of them is very plausible. And that's why we're looking at what looks like a paradox. Um, the first premise is that if it is possible to travel backwards in time, it is possible to create contradictory states of affairs, right? You can kill one of your grandparents before your parents were conceived, nevertheless here you are and exist. That's contradictory, it doesn't make sense. Premise two, it is not possible to create contradictory states of affairs. This 
premise most people would think is pretty easy to accept uh, we cannot be at the same time present in this place and not present I cannot at the same time have two heads and not have two heads and so on and so on um, so the conclusion would seem to follow that it is not possible to travel backwards it's time because either we by changing the past we end up creating uh, self-contradictory states of affairs at least sometimes or um, states of affairs that should not be able to exist but is this a good argument and this is why Lewis's paper is very exciting um, he analyzes the argument in the following way well the argument is valid right because it has the correct logical form if P then Q not Q therefore not P um, and so that works and the argument but is the argument also sound right the question comes up sound means when we are talking in logic and philosophy about soundness of arguments whether the premises are easy to accept are they believable are they true and Lewis says premise 2 is false we can actually create contradictory affairs and the emphasis is on the word can we are able to in some sense this is possible in some sense now let's go back quickly to the argument the second premise is that it is not possible to create contradictory states of affairs so this is what Lewis targets this is what he's attacking if this premise is false then the argument doesn't go true and that would mean that a strong argument against the possibility of backwards time travel would be out of the way right so why does Lewis think that um, premise 2 is false he works with the notion of compossibility to show this and explain this compossibility means and we're quoting Lewis again to say that something can happen means that it is happening compossible with certain facts right if you can raise your arm that's possible because the gravitational field isn't too strong for you to not be able to raise it you have enough muscle nobody tied your arm down your neurons are working fine so uh, you know your motor cortex can coordinate the movement properly and so on and so on which facts that is determined but sometimes not determined well enough by context okay so compossibility basically just means possible together let's take an example you travel back to 1908 Vienna you try to prevent Hitler from going into politics by setting him up for a cozy life as an artist right he, he wanted to become a painter originally but he wasn't good enough and it was a tough time uh, just as it is now and so he failed as an artist he became very embittered and that's one of the things that some people think launched him on an ex extremist political career um, so you know you travel back with a lot of money you buy up all the Hitler paintings and he's just going to be maybe a very mediocre but successful and happy artist and hopefully we have some less crazy politics and uh, conflicts in uh, the world in the 20th century and according to Lewis this is compossible with the local circumstances you can pay him for his paintings right you travel back you have enough money you know where the man is you know where his paintings are and you go there and you just buy the paintings um, it's all good um, but the thing is doing so is not compossible with the broader circumstances right Hitler became the Führer um, <laughs> the uh, leader of the Nazi party and, and of uh, Nazi Germany so what this means is that whether or not we can say that you can bring about a contradictory states of affairs is um, about which facts you're looking at are you just looking at the facts of 1908 at that time very well possible that someone buys up Hitler's paintings makes him a successful happy artist who never goes into politics hence if you look at the broader circumstances that we know today that later Hitler did become a politician and he never became successful we know that well this did not happen so what does this mean then for our ability to change the past well we could summarize it so history lapsed is fixed 
So we can try to change history, but we will fail. That doesn't mean that we cannot act, right? We can try, and that's already acting. We just cannot succeed if that means changing facts which have already been set and fixed in history. Um, to give you an analogy, can A stop smoking? Yes, of course. They have the ability, they have the will, they have the right psychological capacities, they have the right kind of mental state, they don't want to smoke and so on. And they are free to decide to, to do so. In this sense, they can do so. But not in a broader sense, because A doesn't smoke, right? This could be me, right? I can smoke, of course, but I never smoked. I never even had a cigarette in my life, right? So obviously saying that I can smoke doesn't make sense. Uh, it's not compossible with the broader facts. With a narrower set of facts, whether or not I have the right abilities and capacities to stop smoking, it does make sense, and it is compossible. Uh, we are facing the same kind of situation you go back to 1908, making Hitler successful, very much possible. You go back and meet your young grandfather, killing him, very much possible. Then again, if you look at the big picture, is that consistent with all the facts? No, certainly not. So stopping smoking is logically compossible with most facts about me or A. And it is also logically possible to travel back in time and attempt to change history. Um, but it's not logically possible to succeed in changing history when it comes to things which already happened at the time of our departure, right? If I go back from the future, sadly, what happened in the past, including that I went back and I tried to change the past, already happened. My going back and what I did in the past are already a part of history, if history has happened. We think about it. Um, 1908 happened a long time ago. If somebody traveled back to 1908, that time travel, and whatever that person did in 1908, the time traveler, that already took place. It's part of our history. And the way history worked out is just what we know, how it worked out. Maybe somebody did go back and try to uh, change Hitler's mind or personality and his life. Maybe somebody did go back and try to shoot their own grandpa. Didn't work. So we could say that time travelers have two kinds of powers, which align themselves with two kinds of changes in the world. Um, we know already that time travel is possible, logically, and only if it's consistent with history, of course. Uh, the question is then, are time travelers powerless? Um, can they change anything? Well, in a sense, yes, but what is that sense? Um, we could talk about replacement changes. Replacement changes are when one state of affairs is replaced by another. Okay, so an example would be a glass falls down and breaks. It shatters. The shape changes. The glass shape is replaced by shards and dust. And the glass, the shards, the broken glass pieces, they don't exist at the same time. Either the glass exists or the broken glass pieces exist. It's not the same thing. That's a replacement. One thing replaced another. Uh, but you can also look at counterfactual change. Counterfactual change means that if one event wouldn't have happened, another later event wouldn't have occurred either. If you want an example, you can think about if my alarm wouldn't have gone off, I would not have woken up on time. But it did go off, so I did woke up on time. wake up on time. What does this mean? What kind of powers do we have then? What can we do really? Uh, well, Lewis thinks time travelers can make counterfactual changes, um, but they cannot make replacement changes. That is, no time traveler can break a glass in the past if that glass would not have broken otherwise. What are the implications of this? The implications are that if time travelers made changes to history, those changes are already part of our history. So, if you decide and somehow it becomes possible for you to go back into any point in history, that already happened. And whatever you did is already part of our past. You cannot 
effect a replacement change. You cannot change history in that sense that when you come back to today, you find out that history is different because you went back and changed something. So it is not possible for a time travel to change, not change history in a way they already changed it. Uh, that is, history already is the result of all the changes made by travelers and others. Um, and those are the counterfactual changes that people made to history. History is the way it is because people already changed certain things. Just like my alarm clock already went off and I woke up. That already happened. So what happened to Gramps, right? Uh, on this understanding of time travel, there's only one timeline. Uh, you can think about different views of time travel, and one of them would assume that you go back, you're able to make replacement changes, and every time you do that, a new universe is created, which is an exact copy of ours, except the one thing that you changed in it, and the consequences of that change. So you go back, you kill grandpa, a new universe, springs up out of nothingness and in that universe grandpa died and you don't exist in the future either but it's a different universe in which you don't exist so when you come back to your present you're gonna still exist and in your universe grandpa hasn't died now the problem with that kind of branching universe theory among other things is that it's very costly metaphysically and physically you have to assume that there are infinite endless universes that we can create uh, so easily. Um, this is quite hard to accommodate in certain ways. Uh, and usually in science as well as in philosophy, we want, we want less costly theories which don't make such assumptions uh, if you don't have to. So most people think that there's only one timeline. Um, and that would mean that nothing ever really gets replaced. If grandpa lived and he didn't get shot, well, you can't change that. Um, it's good in a certain sense, of course. Um, it is compossible with local facts that uh, Tim Kalkin can kill him, his grandfather, he can shoot him um, because he can shoot, he can aim, he has a weapon, he's in the right place and meets grandfather. And um, in a certain sense, this is also compossible with um, the fact that Tim is grandfather, his grandchild, and grandfather was never shot. No replacement change. Grandfather will not get shot. That's the end of it. Uh, so you get a notion of time travel, and that's the logically, physically, well, physically perhaps not, but metaphysically and philosophically plausible notion of time travel. Do tell me what you think about it. Um, I think it's interesting to imagine that time travel is possible. Maybe people are traveling back to the time from the future and their actions have changed the past in many ways uh, we just don't know yet because we haven't achieved that point in time when time travel becomes possible but it does seem that uh, even if people would travel back with the intention of changing things in a way that things have not happened they would not have a lot of control about whether or not that works if that worked if somebody traveled back and they managed to change the past in a way that they wanted to, that's already how our past is. With that, I'll leave you guys and I'll continue in the next video with some other aspects of time travel. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye-bye!